Folks, our first on-demand workshop, How to Become a Coffee Consultant, is now available for you to learn at your own pace for just 50 euros, and it comes with a certificate upon completion. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for more details. Support this podcast by supporting our sponsors. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode one of a five-part series with first-time guests on the podcast, Martin Mayorga from Mayorga Coffee. Martin, welcome to the podcast for the first time. Thanks for having me. We're going to have a very interesting conversation. We have had some very interesting conversations off air, but uh, you have an interesting take on the specialty coffee industry and specialty, the way that specialty coffee business models are being run. Uh, you are a very successful businessman in the coffee space. And in this series, we're going to talk about are specialty coffee businesses profitable? I want to preface this conversation by saying I would invite anybody who's listening to keep an open mind about this discussion. Please don't feel con- cognitive dissonance about the fact that um, whatever you may think about Martin or I before this conversation, you guys know that I have a lot of opinions on this subject. Um, it is really important that we listen to each other and perhaps keep ourselves open to having different ideas about things. So Martin, welcome. Um, and Thank you. And this first episode is going to be about the business models in specialty coffee. You have a lot of opinions. What do you think um, about the business models that exist in specialty coffee? Well, I think first and foremost, my opinion is about business, period, right? You know, Mm -hmm. my background is I studied finance. Um, You know, I had an offer to go to Wall Street. I turned it down, moved to Nicaragua lived in the back of a cigar farm uh, to learn about cigars, which was what I was doing when I was young that took me to coffee. But ultimately, I'm a finance person. And for mm-hmm. me, any business has to have a model and any model has to be scalable. And any model has to be something you can understand and manipulate variables to really react accordingly. Um, so I've led my growth with that, with my passion for people and communities and my countries where I grew up alongside of that but I always led with with kind of the uh, black and white financial mindset and I think um, maybe a lot of companies are doing the opposite they're leading with their heart they're leading with their ego um, and they're forgetting the business model side of it or they're leading with a wishful thinking business mindset of you know I saw this company go from startup to being bought out for X hundred millions of dollars and I just need to make a brand. And that's not always the way either, right? So you have to have a balance and the congruency between Mm -hmm. the black and white and then what I think is also very necessary, the human part, right? So I think, um, unfortunately, I've seen too many specialty and we have to at some point define what specialty really means because I think it's been uh, Mm -hmm. taken over by by people who think it means something that I don't think it means. They've led with ego, they've led with, you know, some lack of education, and they've led with a lot of big dreams without foundational uh, models and, and, and systems. So I think what that leads to is a lot of these people are hobbyists. And that's great. You know, it's great to have a hobby. It's great to believe in something, love it. But once you put the product before people, common sense and financial discipline, you're not really a business or at least a sustainable one. So I think that's an issue and it's an issue I'd love to see change. And I've tried to mentor and I've tried to work with some of the startups that, you know, I believed had the right idea, but the shininess of the latte art, you know, Instagrammable part of the business really sucks them in mm-hmm. and they it's lose themselves into the, mm-hmm. and I've seen, unfortunately, potentially great companies become nothing. And potentially great companies become nothing but social media darlings that people like and follow and want to be part of. Some racially motivated because apparently now the specialty coffee industry cares about minorities and black people, which I didn't see happen the last 24 years before, uh, you know, things really. And I don't know. I just I, I like reality. I like authenticity. And and I think we should 
put our money where our mouth is and and lead with our mind and our hearts at the same time. And I think profitability is critical to success and to to sustainability. The thing that constantly blows my mind when I get uh, have conversations with successful in inverted commas for those who are just listening, successful business owners, is that the discussion about their business models goes fantastical while we're talking about how many bums they have on seats and when we're talking about how much coffee they're selling. The second it goes to profitability, we start to avoid the rest of the discussion. By we, I mean they. And it's typically a conversation about, but everybody knows there's no profit in in running specialty coffee businesses. I have a a deep problem with that because the specialty coffee businesses that are consumer-facing carry, they are the custodians of this complex agricultural product that people are growing, whether it's an 82 or it's a, you know, 90 plus, there's a whole supply chain of people that are involved in the long-term viability. And we're going to talk about sustainable business models later, but this is a real challenge for what's happening. We have a perpetual revolving door of businesses that think they're the ones that are going to be able to fix this. Why aren't we learning from previous mistakes? You know, I think the forefront of this issue is very straightforward, which is somehow, and I saw this happen, you know, I've I've been in coffee since the mid uh, mid nineties. And I really saw a shift. And I think what happened was after the financial challenges of 2008 and 2009 mm-hmm. and really 2012, 2013, I saw younger people and it was exciting because they cared about coffee and it was, right. it was fun. And, but I think what ended up happening was this mindset of, we think this is coffee. We think this is specialty. So consumers come to us and in any business, the mentality is where are the consumers? Let me find them. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're here and I think they should be here, but I don't expect them to meet me here. I come to them and I say, hey, here's a nice coffee. You've been drinking this. This is a little better. Maybe it's a little pricier, but here's why. And you walk them to where you think the industry and the market needs to be. Which is called a and strategy. I think too many, exactly. And too many people said no. And I tr- trust me, I, 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 I laugh now because the things that I see in the industry now, I literally heard people talk about me as a company being a, a terrible company because Mayorga grows dark, Mayorga sells blends, Mayorga does this. My, mm-hmm. And now that's the, oh, well, blends, of course you sell blends. Well, seven years ago, if you sold blends, you were just not, a, you know, you, you weren't coffee forward, which is a term I hate. Um, so I think what happened is- the first is, time I've heard that, coffee forward? I had a person who came to work for me when I had my facility in Miami, who was a very specialty coffee person. He said, you know, I met you and I talked to you and I didn't realize how- that you guys are actually coffee forward. I said, well, what does that mean? He's like, well, just that coffee is the most important part of any coffee business. I said, well, that's inaccurate. You know, I think the most important part of any business is A, having a good model and B, doing the right thing for the people that you impact. Yeah. I'll never be coffee forward. I'll always be people forward, community forward, common sense forward. But anyway, um, I think it was this kind of um, almost cult-like mentality where it's, Mm. You know, if you roast lighter than this, if you source this, if you don't buy that, if you're not talking about these processes, and it became this little exclusive club, which frankly, to be honest, was a very whitewashed, very mm-hmm. non-diverse club mm-hmm. until recently, which I love seeing that the last four or five years as a Latino who has been very discriminated against in this industry and has, mm-hmm. I, I talked to the producers in El Salvador at the PRF and I said, you know, when you're a Latino and you're being told that by a uh, American buyer that you know your brand isn't considered good because of the name because it's a Hispanic name and you're like well this product is from Latin America I should be considered better because mm-hmm. I'm authentic but there's just almost this thing until a non-Latino or non-African or non-Asian touches it it's not good enough it becomes good enough when it's touched by these hands that mm-hmm. give it the, the the mark of quality and I think that's what happened you know we were, had this like Portland-led drive into what specialty really is what coffee should be what you should be buying and it was almost this polarizing moment where for consumers too i saw Mm -hmm. it i mean consumers would be like i go into a coffee shop and it's intimidating or you know that's still the case yeah i get scolded because i want sugar in my coffee i want 
And for me, it's like, how do you say you care about coffee and producers? Sell the coffee. If people want to put salt in their coffee, let them put salt in their coffee. Who cares? You're moving coffee for producers that you're helping and your ego needs to step aside. But I think that's ultimately what happened is the market was created out of thin air and -hmm. it never existed. And this premise that, you know, this is the, you know, I had a, I was on a podcast, a really great podcast, but uh, the gentleman mentioned the term that specialty is the tip of the spear. (laughs) And it's very true because it's a tip of the spear when it comes to the market and how the market perceives specialty and perceives sustainability and all the things that the problem is that spear is blunt is Mm. being aimed at the wrong target and it's just it's it's not being utilized and that's to me is the biggest frustration of what's happening with specialty it could be such a game changer could be such an opportunity to educate Mm -hmm. you know i've seen more people get scolded when they should have been educated in specialty Mm -hmm. right you know in coffee shops in the industry and unfortunately for a lot i think that's going to start changing because i think economic conditions are changing trade finance oh, yeah. you know which a lot of people don't talk about or know about we were seeing five six seven percent interest rates max and now i've heard of trade finance rates of 13 15 percent um money's getting smarter because the money was lost uh well they have you know, to be people, you know free money's gone out the door two years yeah. ago so well and even yeah. private equity people can be stupid, yeah. <laughs> you know? So a lot of people think, well, if they have money, they're smart. I've seen a lot of very no. unintelligent people with too much money because it's OPM. It's other people's money that they're getting a mm-hmm. asset under management uh, commission on. And they think we just throw whatever against the wall and whatever sticks sticks. And coffee was the cool thing to throw money at. Um, and so I, I just, and trust me, I, I think a lot of people think I I want to, vilify or or not see i want i love small business i came out of nowhere i I started my business with nothing but debt i'm an immigrant who didn't speak english when he moved to the u.s i'm everything that is the american dream build Mm -hmm. a business from nothing work your ass off create Mm -hmm. something make a difference so i want to see that change the problem is the resistance i see from the people where and i tell them look i didn't turn a profit for 10 years Mm -hmm. are you going to be okay with that are you okay with, you know, like I'd say, you eat shit sandwiches for 10 years to be able to have a steak? 100%. 100. And are you ready for that? And most people say yes, but they're not. No. You know, I've helped princesses build businesses and I've helped the average Joe build businesses. None of them really actually want to accept the reality that you will be eating shit sandwiches for many years. You're not going to turn a profit for a very long time. And when you do start turning a profit, you're looking at 3% net profit. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make any sense to me. We're operating an industry that at its best shot has 3% net profit if you're opening cafes. What the fuck are we doing? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things I tell people all the time is, I was the little specialty startups that you see today. I've been those startups. You know, everyone thinks, oh, my org is this big thing. I I didn't start big. I was bringing coffee in before people were doing it. I was probably, I think I was one of the first direct trade companies in the country. The only other people I ran into was the original founder of Counterculture, who then sold to other people. But he and I split a container in like 1995 because neither of us could afford to fill a container. Mm. And we were bringing coffee in directly. But I think... It's just, I don't know. I think there's just a, a mismatch between the realities of business, the realities of the industry. And the romance of it. And there's too much romance. And look, at the end of the day, I don't know. I feel like, you know, I think the point I was trying to make is we were the small specialty, but we outgrew it, mm-hmm. right? And we outgrew it. But I had 12 shops. I had, I had, I was, my biggest issue was I was ahead of my time. In 1998, in Silver Spring, Maryland, I opened a roastery with a Diedrich. I think it was a 15 kilo. Mm-hmm. I had a full bar. We had loaded lattes, which is lattes with alcohol. We did roasting classes. We did cupping classes in the late 90s. Wow. Okay. And we had a lot of Marzocco, four group linea. I mean, it was, everything was ahead of its time. And then I realized very early on, I wake up one day and we have Sunday brunch and I have a chef making freaking omelets. Mm. because it was a 5,000 square foot lounge and I had to pay rent and you start seeing the business model. And again, Mm -hmm. the business model is always going to be a thing for me. And I said, well, what am I really paying rent on? 
I'm paying rent on 90% of space of people sitting around doing nothing and yeah. not contributing to my bottom line. So I started tightening down the model, tightening down the model, and I kept realizing different things. And one of the things that was kind of the epiphany moment that made me shut everything down was I'm not in the coffee business anymore. I'm in the milk business. I'm in the pastry business. I'm in the uh, payroll business, insurance business, tax business, paying rent business. Yep. And coffee is like maybe top 25. Mm -hmm. And then I thought I felt like a fraud. I really mm -hmm. felt like a fraud. And I said, you know, I'm sitting here saying I'm going to help coffee producers and, and go back to my countries and make a difference. My ego has run away on me because I like seeing my name on, you know, signs at 12 shops, including airports. And I'm not in the coffee business anymore. And every penny is fought for in retail and fought for if you're lucky enough to retain the profit. And it just, it, I realized I was, I went the wrong, the wrong direction. 2009, I shut down my shops. So I had 12 specialty coffee shops in, you know, between 99 and 2009. And um, I realized I was better off. And I actually did a presentation to my team. We do um, leadership meetings and then all staff meetings every Friday. And I showed them the chart. I'm like, here's us with our shops. And here's when I close them. Boom. Right. Sounds scary. Sounds crazy. But I already had a plan. I had business, a uh, business model. Wholesale went like this. Mm. So, yeah, it was hard. It was scary. It was, you know, challenging. But. It was the decision to make. And I find myself every three years or so making tough decisions like that. Because after 2009, we built um, direct, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the retail business where we're selling to cafes and coffee shops. Mm -hmm. I had a, a service company called Top Tex. I had four vans, five staff members, and we serviced the special and, and, and drip coffee machines. I had about $300,000 of equipment out on the streets. I shut all that down three years later, because I realized I was being used by retailers and coffee yeah. shops. And they'd say, well, so-and-so is going to give me this. So-and-so is going to give me this discount. So-and-so says this is free. I'm like, oh man, Rice I'm to the not bottom. in the coffee business. I'm now in the equipment business yeah. and coffee is like the thing I'm hoping that I got out of that. So, you know, you, you bob and weave, you zig and zag, and you, you maintain the integrity of what you really want in your vision but you have to have a model, but you also have to be flexible within that model and, and have a vision. And my vision, just to be upfront, is we have an issue in coffee that was created by scale, by traders 200 years ago who were the adventurous ones that went to these countries and, you know, extracted and, and manipulated their way into riches, mm -hmm. created a business model and, and a um, supply chain that then became a multi-billion dollar opportunity mm -hmm. for them and, and and lost opportunity for many people from the countries where I grew up. My goal is I need volume to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that's all I care about is quality and volume. And a lot of people think those things are mutually exclusive and they're hundred percent not. They're not. And what a perfect, perfect segue to the next episode, which is going to be about scalability in specialty coffee. So join us for the next episode, folks. Peace, love and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.